My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster. In this podcast, we try to help people recover, rebuild, and reimagine. One of the things that we are very involved with with our organization at Rebuild North Bay Foundation is how to support landowners in land management practices. And that means a variety of things from how do you employ grazers? How do you, what do you cut? Where do you cut? What kind of grazers will work at different um, times or different types of plants? And really importantly, how can you employ uh, mild fires in order to prevent mega fires? We're in the age of mega fire. And what that means essentially is a fire that has a disproportionate impact on the land and the people who live there. And it wasn't always this way, but we're sort of in this moment of climate change meets uh, land management practices over the past 70 years that are not actually the best for the land. I wanted Che to come on today to give a, a perspective from a landowner, but also somebody who is looking at how do you pass your land to your next generation? And he's, so he's a father, he's a family man, and he's a seventh generation landowner here in Sonoma County. One of the things that our listeners may not be aware of is that 80% of the wildlands in our county are actually privately owned. And maintaining those lands in a way that keeps the rest of us safe is actually incredibly expensive. It really does depend upon a lot of people to come forward to help take responsibility by funding or providing volunteers or listening to the landowners to figure out how is it, how can we support you in making sure that your land is safe and that will keep the rest of us safe. One of the things that happened in the 80s is that there was so much concern about the clear cutting from the lumber industry that the environmental industry then said, you know, we need to stop all clear cutting and we just need to lock the gates and walk away. And it turns out that you have to manage the land. You can't just let it grow wild. You have to do what Native Americans did and what ranchers and landowners did for several, several uh, hundred years. I could even say that. And um, we have to actually look back um, in order to reach forward into a more sustainable future. So welcome to How to Disaster Che, and please tell us your story. Oh, thank you very much for having me on, Jennifer. I do appreciate it. Uh, I am a seventh generation rancher on the same spread uh, settled by my great, 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 great grandfather. Um, I also run a local nonprofit that teaches at-risk youth through paid vocational programming, uh, ecological preparedness, uh, specifically what we'll be talking about today is fire fuel mitigation. Um, and you know, what I like to say about my family history and, and this land here is right across the, the way, across the highway is a uh, school built by my great, 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 great grandfather. So my family has been helping our community for a very long time. Um, so one of the pieces that I, you know, I really want to address today is how we look at, especially our large landscapes, but also our, our you know, uh, wildland urban interfaces and what that looks like as far as how can we treat it, how can we make it safer, and how can we make it more ecologically friendly? Um, you know, we're all familiar with what I call manual, which is what uh, the young people at Circuit Rider Community Services do. Um, we take them out with chainsaws, meters, loppers, and all of that, and they will do treatments of shaded fuel breaks. They will look at ridges and see what we can clear there, and of course, 100-foot defensible space around homes and infrastructure that's important, particularly, of course, water tanks. Um, but that's extremely expensive as far as a way to treat a landscape, uh, usually 4,000 and up per acre to treat um, in heavy woods, you can get to eight, ten thousand dollars an acre. And, you know, we obviously have properties out here that are thousands of acres that have been untreated for a very, very long time. So how can we address that? And how can we do that in a way that is timely, but also uh, most cost effective? So one of the pieces that I would get really excited about is prescribed fire, um, which is you know, it makes people very, very, very nervous. But as an example, um, wandering around with my grandfather when you know, I was five or six, he would light patches on fire and just sit there with a shovel and put them out of, with the shovel if they got out of control. And that used to be a much larger 
landscape application by my family. Um, I, I did a prescribed burn last year, 33 acres. And when I was calling all of our neighbors, they became, well, very nervous and, and rightfully so, because we just we were literally in the middle of the Wallbridge fire when I was proposing to do a prescribed fire. Um, but all of them were recent. Uh, they, they'd moved here within the last generation or so. That's recent to us, um, except for this older gentleman across the highway that had been ranching in my grandmother's time. And when I called him, he said, well, you know, I, we used to do that in the flats all the time until the government told me we couldn't anymore. Um, and so for him, it was just a way of life that uh, was something that we couldn't, that wasn't allowed anymore. And so he was actually very excited to hear that that was coming back and to learn about how he could possibly do that again as well. Um, Can you give us a timeline about when, you know, those prescribed fires were prohibited and also talk about the difference between like a controlled burn and a prescribed fire? You know, they, um, it's not like a, it's not like a pile of stuff you put in your backyard and you get a permit. It's very different. So just for our listeners who aren't familiar. Absolutely. So uh, it's been about the last 50 to 60 years that we've not been allowed to do these burns. Um, and then there's there's two kind of treatment ways. Uh, well, OK, there's three treatment ways and we'll talk about those for a sec. The first is that manual, what we call lop and scatter. So you cut limbs up, you know, six to 10 feet high and you scatter them throughout the forest. So if it does catch on fire, they're all gonna be low to the ground. They're not gonna ember cast. And, and we'll talk about why ember casting is very, very bad and, and how to address it. Um, but then we have you know, pile burning, which I, you know, most of our individuals in the Wuwi, the wildland urban interface are probably familiar with, where you cut limbs, pull them up and you pile. And then in the wet season, or if you have a huge hack or some other way to, to suppress fire, you can burn that. Um, in the dry season as well, you burn those piles down, they're, they're not a fire risk, and all of that, those nutrients go back into to the earth. And then there's prescribed fire, which is the large treatments of, you know, as I said, 33 acres, up to a couple hundred acres even. And one of the benefits of that is not only are we clearing out possibly very, very heavy fuels that can burn super hot and ember cast over a very long way, but it also mimics our ecology here. I mean, we are, our native plants were designed to burn or get gra grazed down and then come back. And the non-natives really can't compete in those environments, especially if you do it in the drier seasons, because our native plants, you know, some of the grasses can go down 40, 50 feet down into the ground with their roots. You graze those down, you burn those down, they're gonna come right back because they can pull moisture out of the soil. But the uh, the invasive. Okay, hold on. I had no idea that that was the case. Just so you know, I had no idea that their roots went down. That I'm I'm impressed. I just had to call that out because I don't think I'll be the only one listening to this who had no idea. But that explains why it comes back so quickly. The grasses. Go ahead. Yeah, and and a lot of people don't. And one of the other issues with our non-native grasses is that you know if, if they go down only say you know six inches or so, and then they what we call mat is across a whole hillside they'll die off in the summer or, you know, but a little bit will survive. And then if we get a heavy rain before they have the chance to grow back, all of that mat is basically just material that's sitting on the side of the hillside. And that's how we get erosion. Um, and our topsoil becomes much poorer. We have, you know, devastating mud flows into the creeks for our salmon populations, our, our, our salmon, steelhead and trout. Um, it's bad all the way around. Sorry, that's my little like side piece on oh, no, do, talking about like, <laughs> non-natives and how much I hate them because I've been fighting them my whole life. Oh no, you can go on as long as you want. It's fine. <laughs> it's like, you know, it is educational, but it's also the story. And so if it needs to be said, then this is the place to say it because we'd also like to prevent disaster. So we appreciate that. Absolutely. And, and we do have some slowly creeping ecological disasters here as well that are related to fire. Uh, an example being, you know, that we, we have um, furs taking over large portions of our county. Uh, we call them, you know, dogwood at some point because they start piling, or sorry, dog hair, and they're super thin and they pile up in these little stands that would traditionally have burned down and the big ones would have survived. But now we have them all piled up. They're all slowly starting to die off. They're choking out the native oaks and they're a huge fire risk. So bad all the way around. We also have this uh, expansion of bay trees into what has traditionally been oak woodland. Um, bays burn very, very, very well, which is very concerning. If you have any by your home, try to get rid of them. Um, and they do carry sudden oak as well. 
and you'll see these little black spots on the on the trees. They're the most important foliar for sudden oak. They're not affected by it at all. And what they'll do is spread up these hillsides, killing off the oaks as they go, which creates more opportunities for heavy fuels. And then they can burn really well um, because of the oils involved in, in their bark and, and in their leaves. Uh, I had a kind of funny but scary experience recently where we were doing a controlled burn with some of my young people from Circuit Rider. We had a forester there from a local organization I won't name. Um, and I'm piling uh, bay trees into a burn pile to burn that are wet. I mean, we just cut them down. And he said, well, why, why would you do that? They're, they're wet wood, they're not gonna burn. I'm like, well, you're, you're a forester. You should, probably should know that they're, they are bay trees. They're going to burn very hot. And sure as heck, they lit off very, very well, burned down. And this gentleman turned to me and said, well, your country people can still teach us a little bit sometimes. And that's also really scary. But I think there's, I think that I do want to put it, I want to put a pin in that for a second, because I think that we have this false dichotomy, which is that somehow if you are a rancher and a private landowner that you are not, that you don't care or know the land. And I think that that, I think there's been sort of a demonization of agriculture in that way. And instead of saying, which I think we're now getting to that point, I have something to learn from you and you have something to learn from me. So we have to work on this issue together. And in that learning moment, you actually probably really help that forester. And then it's okay to say, I don't know. And I'm glad that I learned that today. And I think we have to be more in that mind if we're going to get to where we need to be. Absolutely. And, and I would also say that the vast majority of uh, farmers and ranchers that I know are college educated because you have to be to compete in this marketplace these days. Everything is very scientific. Um, the gentleman that kind of trained me, the, the neighbor rancher who was a board member of our local farm bureau, he used to joke that he was a grass rancher and he studied grass at, at Chico. Um, so it, you really do have to bring in some science and some education because, you know, you don't make a lot of money in agriculture or nonprofit. I don't know what I was doing in both of those fields, but, uh, you know, I, I do uh, work in two nonprofit fields, as it were. But, I, you know, there is something to be said for what people that have grown up and have this generational knowledge can, can teach. And I think that, that also can be very true of, of looking at the tribes. They have deep, deep knowledge that we very much need to tap into um, <laughs> because our ecology was designed by fire that was introduced. And we need to look at how we can use that fire in order to treat land and, and keep us safe. And not be afraid of the, um, the you know, I think that people were well-meaning when they said we want our air quality to be so much cleaner. That was a huge, um, I'm 51, so in the 70s, we heard a lot about that. Um, and it was not a bad thing to say we should have good air quality. But when you look at um, suppressing all wildfire, I would also like Smokey the Bear to go away. And I've said that many times, but suppressing all wildfires me meant that we never had mild fires, that we need those in order to prevent the mega fires. And I think you have to say it over and over again. So I just, um, I really appreciate that point that we can take a little bit of smoke, you know, and, and to avoid the horrific um, air quality issues that we have when we have these massive wildfires that have tons of chemicals in them. Absolutely. And, you know, when, when I see those, that smoke from the prescribed burns, all I think about is all the non-natives and the bay trees that are burning up it kind of makes me happy, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but while you're there though, talk about, you know, one of the things that we didn't, obviously, you know, for most people, including myself, I didn't know very much about wildfire before 2017. And I assumed that when it burned, it was just like the apocalypse. And I remember driving through Glen Ellen and Kenwood and being my heart's just breaking, not understanding that the, most of the oaks were like, we don't care, we're good. So how are oaks particularly adaptable or adapted to um, wildfire? Well, because we, we live in oak woodlands, essentially, well, at least the vast majority of Sonoma County folks, um, they will sprout right back from the stumps. Uh, in fact, most of these flames, especially in these low uh, impact burns, which is a prescribed burn because we, we choose wetter conditions, they won't even go up into the canopy of these trees and doesn't even phase them at all. Um, you know, the, the only trees that really do burn heavily, um, even in, in low fires, are smaller bay trees and then uh, those pines, which, of course, if anybody's ever burned pine while you're back or while you're camping, it's uh, that stuff goes up pretty fast. It does. Then, it's you know, unfortunate because the Paradise Fire was um, primarily pine, which yeah. was a problem. Sorry. Go ahead. 
and then and then we look at things like uh, Scotch broom, French broom, um, gorsh, uh, and that, that stuff's just terrifying because it burns very very well, uh, and it comes right back. You know, we had a property off of Sweetwater Springs Road that my young people pulled five acres of six foot tall Scotch broom right above the home. Uh, the Wallbridge fire came down and just ashed everything else that we hadn't pulled uh, and came down hot and fast because of that Scotch broom. Stopped cold at our fire break, saved the family's home. So my kids are wandering around with their chests out, just so excited, proud of themselves. But we just did a site visit two weeks ago and where it all burned, it's coming right back. But where we pulled it, it's not because we pulled the roots out. Uh, and then that stuff, you know, it'll have uh, root banks that can last for, I think, 25 years. Uh, it's, it's very scary. And what should it clean? And I, we're not just going to make you the forester, but um, just for the um, audience, what should a clean forest look like? Well, a clean forest should have cleared understory. Um, it should have some, you know, mixed smaller uh, saplings that are coming up, uh, depending on, of course, if it's oak or what kind of woodland, um, you'll, you'll have some brush as well. Um, but specifically around your home or any infrastructure that you care about, let's say roads and egress are extremely important. A, a clean forest is something that's a little bit different, which is just everything six to 10 feet up is gone. Um, and so the only way that any of that can actually catch is if the fire starts to crown in high winds and crowning fires, there's not much you can do, but it's gonna take a long time for it to get there and it's not gonna be burning hot enough hopefully to reach you while you're driving up out from under it or touch your home. Yeah, those, those stories are awful. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about grazing. So talk let's, about grazing. More exciting. Yay! We want to talk about the same, same time. Okay. Go for it. Let's talk grazers. I mean, everybody loves baby goats, right? Uh, my wife and I run a hundred head of goat out here in Bodega, 20 head of sheep, 20 head of cattle. Um, and one of the things that a lot of uh, urban folks don't understand is that these animals eat very, very different things. People joke about, you know, goats will eat anything. Well, goats will eat anything in undue stress, but you really, that's a very unhealthy goat. Uh, goats prefer brush, uh, blackberries, uh, and you know, especially the Himalayan blackberries, the invasives, and, and scotch broom, French broom, they absolutely adore, which is wonderful to have them. Um, and then any, any kind of brushing materials, they'll eat the, the leaves off of and then they'll actually start to like use their hooves to balance on it while they eat whatever's higher up and eventually break those things down. Um, when I tried to burn my 33 acres last year, it was the first time that the firefighters had ever tried to burn on a goat ranch and they actually had a significant amount of difficulty burning um, larger swaths because there was no understory on, on my property and the goats had created basically 33 acre um, you know, a shaded fuel break all the way up to about my chin. Um, and then, you know, when we look at grasslands, you know, you have your cattle that can come in and they'll eat grass down, but then they'll still have about this much left over and that'll still burn hot and fast, especially in dry season. So what I tell folks is, you know, you want to bring your cattle in to bring your grass down and then you bring your sheep in and the sheep will just like, it's the perfect, you know, it looks like the, the putting green, you know, at, at Scandia. It's going to be right down there. Um, and when it dries out, it, there's really nothing to burn um, when the sheep are done with it. So they're great for, for fuel breaks and they're great for large fields. And then, as I said, you know, that will come back with natives and they will take over once again. So even in the summer, sometimes you'll have to regraze an area with sheep. Well, can and talk about the um, controversy, like where did the controversy come from with respect to grazers or what are some other, what are the misconceptions about what grazers do are, are due to the land that's not true? Well, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's kind of like that misconception of goats will eat anything. You know, there are unfortunately uh, farmers and ranchers that don't treat their animals very well. And if they leave animals in one space for too long, the vegetation will be completely gone. It'll turn into a dust pit, uh, which you know we've probably all seen that driving around. And then when the big rains come, all of that topsoil goes away. And so the habitat's gone, the, the nutrients are gone, and it looks terrible and it's just bad for everybody involved. Um, there's also, you know, waterways are an issue. You don't want animals in waterways. That doesn't make them very healthy at all. 
And so you either have exclusion fencing or you do rotational, I'm speaking very, very briefly in that area. Um, but I think really rotational grazing is, people are, are starting to understand how important it is for a way to treat land, but also a way to bring back our natives and to sequester carbon. Because as I said, you know, we have these grasses that can go down 40 feet in the soil or, you know, some of these brushes and grasses that can go down even further. Um, well, if you think about it, you know, you have a foot or two of grass and it gets eaten down. As that plant starts to regenerate, it actually starts drawing carbon down to create that new growth. Um, and so there, there is a growing body of science and there has been for a generation that rotational grazing is actually wildly beneficial for our natural world and that it draws down carbon, it brings back our natives. Um, and I think we also have this idea of, you know, cows as an example, you know, the methane that comes from cows. Well, yeah, in a feedlot, absolutely, when they're like, you know, trucked corn. But if you have them out in these open grasslands where they're, they're grass-fed, grass-finished animals, that means they only got fed grass even before they're, they're uh, harvested. Um, then they're rotating through these blocks of land. They're eating that down. They're helping to sequester carbon. And at the same time, they're providing an economic means to support this kind of treatment that we desperately need in our county. Because you must hear about the, the and, I, and I talked about it in the beginning of this, but the, the economic barriers to good land management, there are real concern. And I, and, and I think that I am happy that at this point, unfortunately, the how we got here is so much about um, disaster, but that we are, we, do, we are in sort of a new age of finding the science in the middle and going from there and not just saying, oh, well, I read about, you know, Brazil clear cutting trees for cow farms for McDonald's. There's my dog. My dog would like to be part of this. Um, so, <laughs> you know, therefore all grazing bad, or I don't like my air quality to be um, compromised. Therefore all wildfires are bad. And um, so I'm happy to see that, to see that, but talk about like, what are some of the challenges or what are some of the things that the public or private sector could do to support um, responsible land stewardship and management? Well, I'd say, you know, there, there's always this element of, uh, well, not always, but there's often an element of nose in the air when you encounter individuals who have their own preconceptions of, of what the meat industry looks like and that you're being cruel or being awful. Um, there, there is you know, the, the argument that, well, you know, land that's used for crops growing this kind of protein or whatever is, is much more um, productive per acre for sustenance. Well, that's very true, but I live in Bodega and it's very, very steep and farming that any, any kind of way is completely impossible. It is, it is literally only good for grazing and-, and Well, grazing. and for those who don't know what Bodega is, you'll have to tell them in case they're like in Missouri hearing. So, so, you know, very much uh, rolling hills that are getting towards the, the coastal areas, which are very, very steep. And I have, you know, the vast majority of my property, it's kind of sketchy to take a truck on, much less a tractor. Um, so you, you just simply cannot farm it. You can graze it and those little goats and cows can go up these very steep cliffs, no problem, that have, um, you know, grass all over it. But there's just no way that I'm going to be growing any kind of row crops. It's also, you know, a colder coastal area as well. Yeah. Um, so there, there's yeah, that piece. About it. But, you know, it's also the idea that, you know, people have seen so much about, um, you know, feedlots and the cruelty there. And it's, it's a very different experience in the country. I strongly suggest if anybody's looking to think about buying directly from ranchers, please do, because it's great for us. And we don't have to deal with a lot of the issues and inherent with working with that system, the food system can be pretty awful. Um, but my animals are harvested here on site. Um, you know, they they are happy until the moment of they're not there anymore. Uh, and trust me, they don't feel a thing. And then they are taken to a local butcher shop, which helps to, you know, keep our economy alive. And I feed, you know, upward of 20 families every year that can, you know, say this, this is in the freezer from a local guy that I know who's not only you know, managing his land well, I hope I am, um, but is also you know, somebody that is responsible with that future generation thought of how do we protect our animals? How do we keep the land healthy? And then think about what my son's gonna inherit so that he can do the same. Mm -hmm. 
It's the um, ecosystem, the ecosystem for our safety in wildlands can also include responsible farming and even responsible harvesting. And I think that that has, that that's, that has to be part of the equation. So I absolutely. love that you're talking about that. Um, well, think, go ahead. If you think about, about the way that our uh, ecology was designed, it was designed for huge herds of ruminants to come through and eat everything down or fire to come through and burn everything down and then to grow back. And that's really what we're looking at and what we're trying to mimic with rotational grazing over spread of fire. So what have you seen change since 2017? Can you talk to us about your fire story or what it was like for you to watch? Um, just to be clear, Bodega is in Sonoma County where we are located. And I have, if you've listened to the podcast before, you know that um, we had devastating wildfires uh, in 2017. Um, that took out about 9,300 structures and burned for 23 days. Wildfire is a very different um, thing to contend with over the past four to five years. And, and then since then, we've had four major fires and one last, two last year, one the year before, and maybe, maybe oh, I don't know, I hope not, no more are coming up, but probably they are. So Che, can you tell us about your fire story and it's starting in 2017 and then how you sort of experienced it since then? In 2017, to be clear, it was really more centered in a different part of the county. But if you look at a map of Sonoma County um, in our surrounding areas of fire over the past four years, it looks like a puzzle piece. Like wherever hasn't burned um, the year before, we've seen it then burn the year after. And in this past year, the glass fire actually burned over into the current Tubbs fire scar from 2017. So I would love to hear your fire story. Yeah, so 2017, you know, it was the first big one. So it was a, it was a very different experience. Um, we weren't saying, oh, here we go again. Um, and, and our property was very far away from that. Uh, so even with the power being off, you know, my home was built in 1907 before electricity was a thing here. Um, so we had gravity fed water, um, you know, we could heat with a wood stove if we needed to, it was very hot. Um, and then, you know, we had the ability to cook and, and had hot water because of our propane and I've, I've installed a, a solar um, battery since. So we were trying to be as resilient as possible when it comes to these rolling blackouts, fires, other unfortunate natural disasters that we're experiencing. Um, but, you know, we had all of these individuals basically camping out here because they'd been uh, evacuated or they'd unfortunately lost their homes. And one of the big issues was communication. So we, because of the power was out, we live in a rural community, our cell phones don't work, none of the landlines are kept up anymore by, by the powers that be. And so we really didn't know what was going on, what was burning and where. And that continues to remain true pretty much every fire and every year because living in rural America can sometimes be like living in a third world country because you do not have access to broadband internet or you know, decent cell service. Um, so one, one of the things that I'm very excited about is, thank you, Elon Musk, uh, the, the um, Starlink program that is going to be providing you know, legitimate, strong internet to rural communities all over the world and give them access to all of those resources with obviously you know, the school children as well. Um, we have an unfortunate experience here in Bodega that you'll see a lot of kids going to the local bar in the back room to do their homework because there's internet there. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe so, the press Democrat didn't show up for that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, in, in disasters, that, that issue becomes even more acute because you need to know what's going on and where so that you don't get caught up in this. You need to know if you're in an evacuation zone or if an order has been sent out to you. And something like Starlink can provide all of that information based off of a battery source or a generator. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about. Um, there's a organization that I've partnered with called Sail Relief Team, who goes to uh, disaster zones all over the United States and Puerto Rico. They started in Puerto Rico, in fact, after the hurricane. And they bring renewable energy resources to communities hit by this experience to power communications equipment, to power um, shelters. And so we have a two kilowatt system, 48 kilowatt hour solar trailer that we are storing on the property for whenever one of these things hits so that we can bring it out to power those, those needs. And of course there's a diesel, a diesel generator attached to it as well. 
Um, you know, I actually, so when you're talking about Puerto Rico, um, we, I interviewed this woman, uh, Kelly Thompson, who is the executive director of Vacays Love, it, which is a, Vacays is a little island off the coast of Puerto Rico. And um, she and Mark Martin Gross were on the podcast and they were talking about communication specifically. And um, they actually built resilience hubs um, post their post Hurricane Maria. They didn't have power or communication for seven months, which meant all their um, their ATMs didn't work, their uh, pharmacy couldn't work. And so what they learned about was that they could actually there was one ham radio on the entire island. And so I'm a big proponent of having your own. Um, you know, they may seem outdated. You may not even know what a ham radio is unless you unless you have a grandpa who's into it. Like it's something that when my grandpa was into when I was young, um, you can have portable Wi-Fi. It does exist and, and Amazon even makes it. And so they have three areas in the islands now where they are storing their Wi-Fi so that no matter where it hits, they still have access to at least one, two, you know, maybe hopefully all three, but at least one of them so they are not so stuck. But it's that sort of, um, you know, resiliency at some point has to start at home. And I think the thing about disasters and especially these wildfires, we have a very rough decade ahead of us, is each of us has a responsibility to do what you're doing if we can, um, which is figure out how resilient can we be? How can we actually sustain some of our own communication systems? Um, I bought uh, walkie talkies for my family. So all across the valley, First, I haven't programmed or charged them yet, so I'll probably get on that any minute. Um, but talk about like when you are looking at your own resiliency, you, you know, a rural area in particular, you have to think about how do you help your neighbors? You know, it's not the same as it is when it hits a suburban or a major, major city center, you may be cut off. And so you do need to figure out how are you going to feed, you know, who's, who's vulnerable in your community and what can you do to help? So talk to us even more about what's in that trailer and, um, and how you have built resiliency into your own life. Well, you know, when it comes to neighbors and when it comes to resiliency, I think one of the biggest pieces right now is power. Power is so important, especially when it comes to food security. Um, and because we do have some, some backup power here and, and one other neighbor does, when that power goes out, all of our neighbors show up with all of the meat from their freezers. And then we're just <laughs> trying to like Jenga everything in there as best we can. Um, but it's also the ability to come charge your phone so you can you know go out somewhere and, and get some service and, and know what's going on. Um, there is, you know, unfortunately, not, not any of our neighbors, but there's unfortunately uh, a lot of individuals who have health concerns and they need some of this backup power that they can't frankly afford. And if the power goes out, it, it really could be, you know, do or die. Uh, and then there's the, the problem of, well, transportation, you know, you're, you're out uh, two weeks of fire. You're, there's not, a, you know, the, there was a gas shortage at one point. So how do you how do you get vehicles around? Um, you know, do you have electric vehicles that you can plug into a solar array, or do you have a, a large store of gasoline or diesel um, on your property? Um, and then you know the the unfortunate other part is how do you get out? And so all of our neighbors, um, we we have a plan on which direction and where this fire is coming from, how to get out. And in fire season, I keep a chainsaw, a pair of chains, uh, like to pull out uh, material or trees and, and bolt cutters in my vehicle so that my neighbors can follow us out if we really need to, um, because that is the reality of what we're facing. You never know when one of these things is gonna hit. You do, and masks, have masks, because if you can't breathe, like I learned that the morning um, of the uh, Tubbs fire, I was like, huh, probably I can't, I can't breathe, I'll bet I need a mask, and so, um, you know, have those N95s or whatever. My husband got me a full face gas mask for Christmas, which made me really happy. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that's, but you know, if the more you can do to be resilient, you really do, you really can save your neighbors. And a lot of people don't have the capacity. They don't, they don't have it in their lives or they don't have it financially um, to be able to be that lifeline for other people. So I love the fact that you're like, you are your own resilience hub and to consider how um, important that is and that you can be independent. So I, I love the fact that you carry all that in your car. And now I kind of want it in my car, but I don't know even know how to use a chainsaw, so. Uh, you'll figure it out. <laughs> I don't think well, anybody wants that. 
<laughs> and, and one of the other things that's been, you know, silver linings of this terrible experience um, is that my organization has been pretty steeped in working with some of these community groups that have formed um, that are, you know, fire or emergency preparedness groups because they, we've lived through it now so many times. Um, and people are starting to talk to their neighbors that, you know, especially in the Louis, a lot of these neighbors just have closed gates. They don't talk to anybody and they live on their, you know, 10 to 40 acres. And suddenly people are getting to know each other and they're getting to work together and they're saying, you know, Bill that's 83 up the hill, he can't, you know, do fire fuel work on his property. So let's get up there as a, as a crew, with some chainsaws and let's call some friends in. I got a buddy that has a tractor and we'll mow down his front field. And you're seeing this like wealth of coming together as a community to make sure that everybody's safe everybody's taken care of and that you know who needs your help in these communities. And then they're also going out and they're finding grants and applying for grants to get crews like mine out there to do fire fuel work or buying a QTAC, which is a unit that can go into the back of a truck full of water with a big old Honda pump on it. You can spray down a, you know, a spot fire if it happens. I'm um, surprised you haven't applied to us for a grant for circuit riders. I'm surprised I haven't either. We should probably talk about that. We should talk about that because we purposely have a grants program that fills gaps. We love a gap. We love a gap that a traditional nonprofit um, can't do because you don't even have to be a nonprofit. If you have five or more neighbors and you want to do like a fuel mitigation um, project, we love grazers. Like we actually funded the websites for match.graze because we were like, oh, we love oh, that. Stephanie's it's done me since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Oh, so and talk about that though. Like that was so smart of her. And we love supporting people who are smart and really um interested in making, you know, a difference or aren't afraid, you know, love new ideas. So tell me about match.craze and why you like it, because I love it. So match.craze is a California currently, but hopefully soon the world um program that will match grazers with fallow lands. So if, say if you have brushy uh, land, you can go out there and you can find some goats. Or if you have large amounts of grassland, you report that you have grassland and you know they, you can bring in some sheep or some cattle to eat that down. Uh, it was created by the uh, University of California Extension. Uh, it's, they like to call it a uh, dating service for grazing. And it has been a wild success. Uh, one, of, one of the issues with not that, that um, website, but in general in California is that there's not a lot of agriculturalists left. Um, I don't have enough goats right now, and I've been building my herd for five or six years to graze my own property, much less my neighbors. And so getting young people involved in agriculture, I think there's going to be this new push because, you know, as I said earlier, we don't make a lot of money, but if there's a way that you can graze, sell the meat from these animals, and also get paid to do mitigation on properties, I can see a lot of the brain drain that we're experiencing in Sonoma County of young people leaving because it's a rural area and there's not a lot of opportunities, staying because there is a viable way to make money and contribute to, to keeping your community protected and fed at the same time. And there's nothing wrong with uh, vineyards. Like I like vineyards, they're actually great fire breaks, but not everything has to be or can be converted into a, a, into a vineyard. And when people think Absolutely. of us, they think of all vineyards, and of course, a lot of our lands have been, but if you drive around Sonoma County, there's still an awful lot of grassland, and um, it's not, it, it's good for it to, it's good to have diversity in your crops, it's good to have diversity in your economy, but, you know, especially if there's a little bit of help from the public sector and dedicating funds and support and making the regulatory um, landscape more friendly to navigate, um, I do think that you might have a chance to have more young people want to invest. What are you hoping to see over the next uh, five to 10 years as we enter into this, you know, we're currently in a drought, um, into really this era, we, we, you know, I, I know I'm harping on it, but this is what I obviously do for a living, um, this era of mega fires. Like if it, in a perfect world, how would we address the next five to 10 years? So I think first and foremost, I, there needs to be a way for CAL FIRE to interface with volunteer units more. Um, la our last fire last year, I had 600 people signed up to come cut fire breaks and then due to insurance or, or what, what have you, they were not allowed to do that. You know, we had dozers, we had water trucks. Um, and and I, I understand why, you know, government moves slow, but fire lines are really not that complicated to dig or cut. 
Uh, you just need to know how and when to get out is the, the most important part. And there's a program called Fire Forward that's starting to build some of those volunteers. My wife and I qualified a couple of weeks ago so that when one of these big fires happens, we can actually be deployed out and be a quick reaction force to, to fight some of these larger fires. So I'm hoping to see, you know, we, we have our small volunteer units um, in, in rural areas and towns, but I wanna see a larger outreach by CAL FIRE to bring in quick deployment volunteers that can help to, to get under professional firefighters um, at, on crews and actually do some of this work. And I will I get, also, I, I, want to, I want you to go in that, but I will give a shout out though in this in the sense that, you know, CAL FIRE is hampered and, and also guided by en environmental laws. And environmental laws are really important. There's a reason why California is so beautiful. You know, there's absolutely. a reason why we have green belts. Like we want all of those things to remain. Um, but, I, you know, I have to say that I'm impressed by the last um, couple of years of CAL FIRE really taking a new look at their policies and absolutely. pushing for those permissions. Like we have a North Bay Forest Improvement Program that is funded by CAL FIRE specifically for uh, landowners like you so that we can pick, so the public sector can pick up the cost. But the amount, it took us two years to, to really, really finish out the full structure of that program. It's only $1.5 million and it will only help about 40 landowners. So indeed, you know, there needs to be greater investment, but I do think they're headed in that direction. And so I want to like give them a shout out and encourage them <laughs> even more so to not, to like lean it all the way into the kinds of ideas that you're talking about, which is volunteer forces, fire breaks. I love when I'm seeing more and more in the paper, um, in the media rather, about fire breaks, but go ahead. So what else would you like to see? Well, I think that, you know, we have these, these three legs of the stool of fire fuel mitigation. We have that manual, we have the prescribed fire, and then we have the prescribed grazing. Um, my organization, my great hope when we, we work with our young people is to train the next generation of young folks who can go out on some of these properties, look at the property and tell the homeowner, this property is appropriate for this, this, and this, and this is where, and this is how. And so having all three of those tools under one hat would be amazing. Right now, all of that is very, very siloed. Um, our county is kind of looking at starting to put an idea of all of that under one roof, um, but it, it's going to be a process. It's going to be a learning curve because all of this is, is very, very new. Um, I would and, like to and, work on that with you. Just so you know. All right, let's let's okay. make that happen. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, the world. Yeah. Um, and then you know, I, I really also want to highlight that we need to do this in an ecologically friendly manner. Um, there, there is this idea of just like make a desert around your home. Well, that's not either aesthetically pleasing nor healthy for the landscape at all. Um, and so we can use some of these tools um, as you know, fire and cows is the perfect example of being a positive tool on the landscape instead of seen as these negative, nasty, bad things like they have been traditionally looked upon. And I, and I hope to see that shift as we move forward. Uh, I also wanna see, you know, as I said earlier, some uh, more energy and uh, especially communications resiliency in our communities. And, you know, if I can say anything to, to our president right now, is please, please, please get some rural internet out there because our communities are hurting and, and our rural communities are dying because that is an access and equity piece. We actually, uh, there is a request for our input and information um, that FEMA published in the Federal Register on April 22nd. And I have the link for that if you're interested. Um, but one of the, we are, we are doing a full suite of answers. And one of the things that we're pushing for um, very hard is that in the definition of, of um, equity, we want rural. Um, because if you are a rural community and you experience a disaster, you have very little access to anything. And if your county is not well resourced, if you um, don't have a healthy economy, or if your economy is in transition, like from logging to tourism, and you lose all the tourism, you probably, um, you have a very low chance of recovery without a significant amount of help. And so we want to look at regional equity and rural equ equity, and we choose the communities often that we serve based upon, um, can they not afford to have an expensive uh, consultant come in and help them navigate this? But the rural issue, especially with wildfire and disaster, is massive, and it's a huge inequity, 
And I'm glad that FEMA is asking the question. We're just also asking them to change the question that they're asking or add, I just want an addition. <laughs> I love it. Well, and if I can go off on a quick tangent as far as we're talking about energy and equity, um, we live in an area with some huge uh, uh, trees that block out sun. Solar is not a, a, an option for a lot of our community members, but in many of those communities, these are older homes, they're gravity fed homes. Uh, micro hydropower is something that is alive and well in New Zealand, Canada, and uh, Northern Europe, and is something that we don't even have access to. I can't get somebody to install a unit here, um, and a unit for for me would, that would produce about 2,500 kilowatts a day. That you have to need. define what that is. Also, my dog, you can leave this in lane, but she is snoring, so I have to address that. Um, I want you to define I micro. Can't hear. Okay. So we, we're all familiar with hydropower, right? But there's also these smaller units with smaller flow and smaller head, which means drop and, and uh, gallons per minute. Um, they can also produce a great deal of, of electricity. And so once you can't, I can't hear. It can, he can't hear Gigi. That's what he's saying. Okay. It's okay. You yeah, can leave I, this I, in That's like, the dog's name. I was trying to figure yeah. that one out. Yeah, yeah can't, sorry. Can't. That's Gigi Grace snoring. So as an example, this Sweetwater property that I'm talking about, every single home in that community has a run of pipe from Sweetwater for at least 4,000 feet. So that, that builds up a lot of energy along the way. And all of those homes, basically once the, their tank is full, it just you know either stops if there's a float on it or runs out. And so putting a unit on the end of these pipes that is constantly running 24 seven can actually produce power to the home the unit's $695 compared to $18,000 for a comparable solar system. And it can be installed in, in areas with smaller, or certain areas that don't have access to solar. Uh, because you know, if you live in the middle of the Redwoods, you've driven through the Redwoods, you know, there's no way you can put a renewable energy source of solar or wind there. Let's look at some of these other options for our rural communities. Okay, I've never heard of that, and I live in this space, and I think it sounds amazing. So, um, Water Buddy, check it out. W A T T E R. Okay, I totally okay. will. You know, because yeah. that's the other that's the other lesson is that you know there is no one solution uh, suits or fits all, um, and this is why collaboration is going to be key in how we get through the next decade and how we really get through our whole lives anyway. But um, is to de-silo and it is to um, invite strange bedfellows and to um, you know, all the best brains and knowledge and experience, and then have a, a level of um, mutual curiosity and respect to get through it. So I'm, Absolutely. Because that's how I just learned about micro hydropower. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm so excited. I like that. <laughs> um, so you are, we're going to, you know, we have about 10 more minutes at most, but um, so I see what you want to, what, what you like to see over the next 10 years is maybe some applied innovations. I'm always amazed by how much stuff actually exists that could that could uh, resolve or address or mitigate a lot of these issues. But you know, you are a young father. And so talk to us about the kind of what you're hoping to leave um, for your child and, uh, and your greatest concern. Oh, boy, there's so many concerns. But you know, every generation of my family has, has done something for uh, the next that has been kind of a large project. Uh, we're talking about water resources. We're in the middle of one of the worst droughts California has ever seen, or I think we might have just passed into the worst drought since we started recording. Um, I'd love to put a pond on property. It's very, very expensive to do so, especially with the permits, but that would give us at least a little bit of breathing room. Um, as far as uh, you know, a broader landscape, I'd, I'd like to see a larger coalition of individuals using those three legs of the stool to treat our landscapes for ecologically friendly um, landscapes and, and for fire fuel landscapes. Um, you know, I, I hope that we see a transition towards greener ways of living um, and a knowledge about our, our rural spaces and our rural peoples that urbanites can access um, and that they see that, you know, A, you know, we're, we're educated and, and uh, about our properties and our lands and what those lands need. And we're providing a, a resource and a food source, I hope, that is valuable and will be sourced from us much more than those massive farms in the middle of the country. They have their place too. But, um, you know, small farmers, we need your help, please. Um, 
my concerns are are vast, but they're mostly with our our natural world. Um, climate change is real. Uh, growing up, you know, we I knew a bunch of the more conservative old ranchers around here saying it wasn't. Now they're saying it's natural, but you know, um, you know, it's it's a very real thing. We're we're experiencing the worst drought ever. We've seen the worst fires ever. Um, our our uh, ocean has lost ninety seven percent of its kelp forest in the last three years on the Sonoma coast. Um, we're seeing a collapse and a disaster on an ecological scale that we can't we can't quite understand uh, because it's so vast. And I, I hope that with some of these tools and some of these new, young, excited people that are trying to learn how to, to make their dent, um, I hope that we can turn it around and, and make our community safer, our world safer, and my son can live in a place that's a, a little bit less wildfiery and droughty for sure. Well, you know, I just really want to thank you, Tay. Um, we're going to link uh, two articles um, below this podcast. Um, one is a first-person essay that you wrote that's incredibly beautiful about what it is to inherit um, inherit the land and what it means to pass it forward. And um, But also a really great article that was just published about prescribed burning. And um, if anyone wants to look him up or talk to him, you can you know, let us know. We believe that so much of the way we're going to get through this is you know, community to community, person to person. Um, and again, that um, endless curiosity. And I really uh, respect you a lot. I think you're very cool. Which I said, I posted that on Facebook even to lure you on this podcast. Um, but <laughs> thank you for all of your stewardship and your, um, and your care. Well, thank you for all that you do and getting the word out. My pleasure. Okay, we are done. This has been How to Disaster the Podcast. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.